Uh, Doc, we got a lot of things that we want to talk about this evening. First of all, we want to kind of let you know about uh, what we do here at Manhood Mindset. Uh, well, Manhood Mindset is, is the uh, national initiative from Omega Psi Phi Returning Incorporated. It's called Brother, You're On My Mind. And what we're trying to do is talk about specific events and specific instances that affect the mindset of African American males. Now, what we try to do with this show is try to help as many people as humanly possible. They don't have to be an African American male, but what we want to do is be intentional about the demographic that we're trying to help. And uh, we want to applaud you for the work that you've done. And we want to kind of go a little bit more in depth uh, for the people who may not be familiar with who you are. We want to try to see if they can understand you and how they can get in contact with you as well. Now, what a lot of people may not understand, we've heard of that phrase, uh, school to prison pipeline, right? And a lot of people may, you know, I know a lot of people may... Uh, uh, repeat that phrase. However, they don't necessarily know the details between how can a school directly pipeline human beings into the prison system. So can you elaborate on that whole notion? We see over the last 40 years a consistent increase in the amount of funds spent on education and a consistent decrease in the, uh, excuse me, a, a consistent increase in the amount of funds spent on incarceration and a consistent decrease in the amount of funds that are spent on education. Okay. And another thing, people need to be very clear that the purpose of education was always to get employed. Public education was created because capitalism put pressure on the government to, pro to provide them with a better educated low-wage earner. Okay. It was the corporations and factories of America that said, listen, if you want to keep our businesses in the country, then provide us with a better educated low-wage earner. Provide us with people who can at least read, count, and write. So from its inception, America, American education existed to provide the factories with efficient labor, right. minimally, basically skilled, trained laborers. Well, at towards the end of the 20th century, and definitely now in the 21st century, especially following uh, Bill Clinton's NAFTA and President Barack Obama's Trans-Pacific Partnership, even more corporations and jobs are being shipped out of America and sent to second and third world countries. So you're seeing the intensification of unemployment in this country. And with that intensification of unemployment, a widening of the gap between the haves and the have-nots. Mm -hmm. So we have to really see incarceration as a function of, eco of, of a lack of economic opportunity and a lack of educational participation. In criminology, they study what gives rise to crime. And one of the basic explanations for the rise in crime is a drop in economic opportunity, period. When jobs are plentiful, crime goes down. When jobs are scarce, crime goes up. Why? Because people have to break the law in order to feed their families because the society in which they live has not provided adequate opportunity for everyone. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the school to prison pipeline, that's exactly what it is. In fact, I was told by a judge in New Jersey, I was told by a judge in New Jersey a couple years ago that she sees more children in her courtroom because of school offenses hmm. then she sees children in her courtroom because of street offenses. Okay. And I've even heard this from educational lawyers that the school increasingly in most states in this country it is the school that is the primary provider of new criminals to the injustice system of America. Not the gangs, not drug dealing, not gun carrying, not stealing cards or hustling credit cards or strong arm robbery, but it is the school and the school police that are increasingly becoming the leading cause of juvenile incarceration and ultimately adult incarceration for black boys. So literally, they are going from the school to the prison, and part of that stems from the fact that with the so-called zero tolerance, get tough policies in America's public schools, which ironically was birthed because of white student crime, Columbine and all of these other white student massacres where white students came in and shot up white students, ironically, laws were created that were allowed, that were used 
to justify the excessive suspensions and expulsion in juvenile detainment of black children who were not guilty of mass shootings in America's public schools. Columbine, more than anything else, gave rise to the zero tolerance culture in America's public schools. But Columbine did not happen in Brooklyn. Columbine did not happen in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Columbine did not happen in Chicago. Black children do not have a history of coming into the school and shooting Okay, defenseless students who had nothing to do with any type of situation that may have arisen against them. That was a white massacre. But white massacres have been used to intensify the, in criminal, the, the criminalization of black males. And the last thing I would say is in my work, I haven't done this for almost 20 years officially, mm -hmm. in more than 20 years unofficially, I would say that I have discovered six steps that America has created to basically see to it that every black male child in America becomes the casualty of the psychoacademic holocaust, the mass incarceration system, premature extermination. The first stage is miseducation. And it is important that your listeners understand that that miseducation is deliberate. It is not an accident. It is not a byproduct of poverty. Mm -hmm. It is not a byproduct of underpaid teachers. It is not a byproduct of incarcerated fathers. It is not a byproduct of unmarried uh, mothers, it is not a byproduct of listening to too much gangster rap. The schools deliberately undereducate black males, and why? The most revolutionary thing you could do in America is properly educate a black male. Yeah. When you properly educate a black male, you see to it that the last becomes first and the first becomes last. Hmm. A properly educated black male is now in a position to rival the white male for economic political domination of America. This is a system based on racism, and it is maintained by racism under a so-called facade of colorblindism and the illusion of inclusion. So a, a properly educated black boy is an enemy of the state. A properly educated black boy is an enemy of the state. And as such, they must, they must see to it that a black boy is never, properly, is never properly educated. Then we go to stage two, special education. The deliberate and unnecessary evaluating and placing of black children with so-called learning disabilities in these special ed classes where they are destined to fall even further behind and ultimately will not be able to pass the graduation examinations that more than half of America's states now require of graduating 12th grade seniors. And then we move into psychiatric medication. This is when they start diagnosing our kids with ADHD, conduct disorder, mm -hmm. oppositional defiant disorder, intermittent explosive disorder, disruptive behavior disorder, and they subsequently prescribed Ritalin, Adderall, Concerta, Meditate, Vyvanse, Risperdal, Prozac, Duplicol, Paxa, the list goes on. And then after psychiatric medication, juvenile incarceration. They have to the kicking the boys out, send them to discipline school, send them to the juvenile detention centers. They come out of the juvenile detention centers that's stage five, psychological frustration. This is when the black boy begins to realize that he was bamboozled, he was hoodwinked, he was run, run amok, he was led astray. He knows that something unfairly was done to him that saw to it that he was criminalized even before he's ever been arrested. And then that takes us to the final stage, stage six, which is premature extermination, normally at the hands of another black male. One out of every four black males will be murdered at the hands of another black boy, largely suffering the same debilitating effects of the psychoacademic holocaust i.e. the six stages of death wow um <clears throat> one thing that stuck out to me is when you talked about the um the entire process of making sure young black males at least get exposed if not properly transferred to the prison system uh one thing that i think of is the excessive discipline or the discord of, I guess, uh, unruly or undisciplined children. Uh, I know you've seen um, l small students get written up on specific occasions uh, by just doing certain things that other kids are doing. Now, I understand that we may have students who have uh, exp extreme cases, right, when you become a harm to yourself or other students. However, have you seen and can you elaborate on the discipline system as far as write-ups for young black boys in the school system? The United States Department of Education released a landmark report approximately two years ago when they looked at the discipline 
of black, excuse me, the discipline of, of children, period, in America. Student disciplinary practices across the United States of America. And they found that black boys, and we were not surprised, just as in the criminal injustice system, it's the same thing in the miseducation system, the same racial disparities persist. They found that black boys were suspended and expelled at three, four, five, six, seven times the rate of white boys for the exact same offenses. And even more shockingly, the information also suggested that black boys in kindergarten and preschool were being suspended and expelled more than white boys in high school. In mm -hmm. fact, the greatest rise in suspension and expulsion was for preschool and kindergarten. So the question that black America and all of America needs to ask itself and, of course, most of America could care less because the people who will enslave you have no problems miseducating you. A people who will enslave you have no problems miseducating you. But the question that black America has to ask itself, what can a four, five, or six-year-old do? What can a four, five, or six-year-old do to be permanently barred from receiving an education? And to help explain this reality, we need to look no further than the racism of America's predominant white female public charter parochial independent and private school teaching core. 97% of all teachers are women, and 93% of the 97% are white racist females. So when you're looking at suspension, when you're looking at expulsion, when you're looking at uh, retention, when you're looking at any type of index of academic maladjustment or failure to succeed, we have to realize that the conduit for all of this is the white female teacher. The classroom don't teach, the books don't teach, the curriculum don't teach, the lesson plans don't teach, the building don't teach, the principal don't teach. It is the teachers that teach. So it is the teachers that make the disciplinary referrals. It's the teacher that recommend a child that be suspended. It's the teacher that, you know, ultimately in concert with the principal, will recommend that a child is uh, referred for expulsion by the local public school board. So the white woman is often left off the hook. She is often basically ignored in this whole process. She's treated like she's a victim when the truth of the matter is she is the leading perpetrator of the school-to-prison pipeline. And if you want to reverse this, all we have to do is give black boys strong black man teachers. Strong black male teachers is the solution, but it will never happen. And why? America, America's public education system is a white female-dominated institution. In fact, it is probably the only institution, along with nursing and social work, that is predominantly female. And as a result of that, because it is dominated by white women, they are not about to eliminate the the numerical dominance that white women have in that profession by hiring black males because that's not what that's not what's in the best interest of white teachers. They don't want black men in the schools because black men are not going to stand by and watch their sons be disrespected by white folks. They're not going to stand by and let that happen. So the best way to deal with that is to prevent black men from coming into the schools. Go to almost any school. How often do you see a black male? How many of us have black male teachers? Hmm. How many boys in America have ever had a black male teacher? And they will come up with all kinds of excuses for why that is. They'll say, well, black men don't want to teach. Teaching is considered feminine. Yada, yada, yada. It's a bunch of nonsense, and I'm going to tell you why. These programs in America, emergency teacher certification programs in America, where they give a lot of white males, white males, who do not have any concern whatsoever with black children, and white males are all in inner cities across America teaching black children with emergency teacher certifications. They do not have a degree in education. They do not have a license. But they are in there under emergency certification so they can do what? Pay their bills. Why can't you do the same thing for black men? We have over 2 million African Americans in this country with master's and doctorate degrees who cannot find work. Why not get some of these unemployed black men who do not have a prison record to come into the schools and work with our boys. Are you trying to tell black people that white men care about black children more than black men? That's an absolute lie. The reason we don't have more black men in the schools is because they're not interested in bringing them into the school. Hmm. Okay. Now, one thing that you did mention earlier was the special education aspect of everything that's going on. Um, 
can you elaborate on uh, I, I know I mentioned, uh, well, I, I've actually heard you say before, and correct me if I'm wrong, that if a neurological disorder is, I would say, uh, claimed on a student, don't you need a neurological test, right? So how can someone determine a neurological disorder without a neurological test? Uh, good, good point. I would say that if you want to scientifically verify the presence of a presumed learning disability, then you would need to have a neurological assessment. Okay. But neurological evaluations are not required. Okay. They are not required by law for the evaluation of children for special education disability and service. They're not required. Okay. Very few children receive them. And even with neurological assessments, you still have to be careful because even with those, you know, they're not totally scientific. At the end of the day, the conclusion is made by the evaluating psychologist. And that is one thing that parents need to be very clear about, black parents in particular, that when the psychologist makes a determination, the psychology, we make determinations. That determination is based on our own professional experience, expertise, bias, and training as it relates to the numerical data that the tests we get inform us with. It's based on the qualitative data that we get from interviewing the parent. We get from interviewing the teacher. We get from reviewing a child's record. So you have all this data, and then you must make a determination. The tests don't make that determination. There is no test that diagnoses anything in anybody. There is no test that diagnoses anything in anybody. We do the diagnosing. We do the diagnosing. Hmm. And it is important that parents understand that it is human beings, not tests. It is the human being that ultimately says your child has a reading disability, a math disability, ADHD. It is a professional opinion, and it is nothing more than that. So when, when someone says my child has a reading disability, we're not seeing that. They're not stating a fact. All they are stating is the fact of someone's opinion. Mm -hmm. That's all that means. The psychologist said my daughter has a math disability. That's the psychologist's opinion. Mm -hmm. They can't prove it. They can argue it, but they can't prove it. It's sort of like going to court. You have to do what? Prove beyond a reasonable doubt. You don't have to prove that they did it. You have to prove that. You have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. So it can still be a doubt but you just have to prove your case beyond a reasonable doubt. Right. There is no, uh, there is no, what's the word for it? There is no a way to totally rule out the fact or rule in, you know, did he commit the murder? You know, did O.J. did it? We'll never know if O.J. did it. Mm -hmm. the, the court case wasn't even about O.J. doing it. The court case was about whether or not the prosecution could prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he likely committed the murder. You see, because there could be no total way to know, mm -hmm. because you don't have all the facts. It's opinion. Same thing with the psychological evaluation. It's what that psychologist says, your child has a reading disability. What they're saying is that I believe, beyond a reasonable doubt, that your child may have one. Can they prove it? No, they can't. It is an opinion. Hmm. Okay, for ladies and gentlemen, for people who may not know who we have online right now, we have none, o none other than Dr. Umar Johnson, school psychologist and pan-Africanist. Uh, we're talking about the uh, mental effects of schooling in our country and across uh, all over the world, actually. And we're talking about just the mental capabilities and the mental, I guess, destruction that people may go through in those four walls of our educational system. And we've already talked about uh, the school to prison pipeline. We've already talked about the ADHD wars. Uh, we have already talked about uh, several instances that people just need to look out for. Now, Dr. Umar, I want to want you to elaborate on when people hear all of these situations that you mentioned earlier. I know, I know you probably have, and correct me if I'm wrong, witness the helpless uh, mentality or the helpless attitude from not only students but also the parents and other stakeholders in the community. So what are some things that people can do when they hear all of these things that, are, that may be stacked up against them? What are some things that they must understand before they try to find out a solution? Well, I would say the greatest problem that we have right now in uh, or on our side on the community side of the equation, stepping away from the racism uh, momentarily is that 
we have a culture, a crisis of indifference. We have a crisis of indifference among black children. They are so turned off and disinterested in their education that I would argue that more often than not, the test scores and grades that our children get are not reflective of their skill level at all. Okay, it is reflective of their interest. For the, for the average black child, a C does not mean I can only do C work. Mm -hmm. A C means I only care to do C work. You know, if a child scores below basic on the standardized assessment, that below basic score does not indicate that the kid is below basic. It indicates that that was all he was interested in putting out. I mean, I'm telling you, we have a culture of learned helplessness in the schools. We have a culture of I could care less, and I'm going to blame the black community as well as the black family for this because we do not value education as a community. I mean, let's think about it. We do not, we do not encourage, we do not celebrate high-achieving students. All we care about is athletes. I mean, we just have to be honest. The black community only cares about athletics and entertainment. A child can be failing every subject in school, every subject in school he can be failing. But guess what? If he's the best basketball player, he will be champion, he will be celebrated, hmm. he will be honored. Meanwhile, you might have a kid in that school that straight A's and B's, National Honor Society, one in the top percentile of all children in America, and you might not even know who that kid is. And we see this regularly across black America. So we are sending our children a very dangerous message that basically says academics are irrelevant. Talent is the only thing that matters. Hmm. So when we get into a situation where the parents play a major role in the miseducation or just the, um, the lack of support of our youth, um, are you saying that we have to start asking ourselves the tough questions of how are we supporting the system that's basically, you know, disarming our young boys and girls? Without question, it's the same as it relates to racism in general in America. And that is to say that although racism is the primary cause of black America's issues, we are in fact its number one accomplice. Mm. We do more than anyone else or anything else other than systematic racism to disenfranchise and, 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 and imbalance the opportunities that we have. And it's the same thing in public education. Mm -hmm. You know, apart from systemic racism in education, the greatest supporter and collaborator with that system is the black community itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, homework is an endangered species in the black community. Mm -hmm. You know, you walk into a school and do a survey, how many kids do homework every night? And you'd be surprised if you get more than, you know, 10% of the kids in that school. There's no homework. There's no reading. You know, very few black homes have a bookshelf. Very few black homes have a dictionary. Very few black homes have an encyclopedia or a thesaurus. You know, um, it's, 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 it's a shame. It is absolutely horrendous um, how we are encouraging the school to put the pipeline. I mean, even without Christmas shopping, I always thought, you know, the parents, you know, when I'm doing my lectures, like I was in Mount Vernon, New York the other day, and I, and, I, and I spoke to the parents about how, you know, the gifts you buy your child are setting them up for future incarceration because you're investing in things that take them away from academic improvement. Mm -hmm. You're investing in cell phones, video games, laptops, HD TVs. I mean, I don't have to tell you that black children watch more TV than any other child in America. Mm -hmm. I don't have to tell you that black children spend more time on their cell phones than any other child in America. I don't have to tell you that black children spend more time searching the Internet and playing video games than all the other children in America combined as a percentage. So why are you investing in devices and activities that are going to take your child away from academic practice and enrichment? Hmm. You know, time that we spent years ago when we were growing up, time that we spent years ago reading is now spent video gaming. Time that was spent doing homework is now spent surfing the Internet. Time that was spent, you know, studying for the test is now being spent on the tablet. So black America, i.e. our parents, are literally wasting millions of dollars, billions even, distracting their children 
from improving their education. So we are literally financing their future incarceration. Dr. Umar, as a child in this whole system, when I go to school um, and see all of the barriers that you mentioned earlier, and then I come home and see more distractions and more barriers for the kids that may be listening to this podcast or this radio show right now or who could be listening in the future, if I'm a child and I get all of this from all different areas, from school and at home, what are my options? Three things. Three things I always tell children that they have to focus on as children in order to lay that pathway for future success. Number one, you have to develop your discipline. You have to develop the Mm self-control to do what you need to do when you don't want to do it. One thing about all great achievers, all great inventors, all great leaders, all great people throughout history, You know, Africans and non-Africans, the racists and the non-racists, all great people have one thing in common, and that is they were able to sacrifice. They were able to sacrifice the things they wanted to do Mm -hmm. so that they could achieve the thing that they desired to do. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to give up in order to go up. The better person you want to become, then the less free time you're going to have. The better person you want to become, the less time you're going to have hanging out with your friends. There is a price to be paid for success. And children need to start paying that that price early. Mm -hmm. Uh, Number two, commit to being the best. You know, as I said, we have that crisis of indifference. We have a crisis of complacency. Mm -hmm. Too many black children are simply content with being average. That is a big problem, okay, this, this whole thing about being average. I don't mind just being another, you know, uh, 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 Joe Schmo. And because of that, a lot of our children will end up unemployed because they're not the best of the best. You have to be the best of the best. There is no place for second place in America uh, for anybody, and especially mm-hmm. not for black folks. As Malcolm X said, you've got to be twice as good to get half as much. And then the third thing, they need to read more. Our children do not read. Mm-hmm. The average working vocabulary level of a black child in America is two grades beneath the current class standing. So if you're a senior, your working vocab, the words you use in conversation and the words you can understand in print are only on the 10th grade level. And for a lot of kids, it's worse than that. Mm-hmm. Some children have a working vocabulary level that's four and five grades beneath their standing. Imagine a 10th grader whose working vocabulary level is on the 5th grade. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he don't read. And this is why I tell parents, you've got to put books in front of these children. Take away the video games. Take away the tablets. Take away um, the laptops and and, and everything else, the cell phones, and put books in front of them. Mm -hmm. Because when you read, you know, there's four things that happen. You improve your working vocabulary. You improve your general knowledge of facts and information. You improve your ability to communicate in conversation. And you improve your ability to communicate in print. Mm-hmm. Four things that are absolutely necessary in order for you to do well on any examination, whether it's the state exam or whether it's the college interest examination. So just by reading, mm-hmm. our children improve their abilities to do better. One of the reasons a lot of black parents believe that their children get a better education when they stick them in white schools isn't because they're really getting a better education. Mm-hmm. In many cases, they're not. But you know what happens when you go from the hood school to the suburban school? What's that? The level of vocabulary, the quality of conversation, the quality of language that is used by the teachers, by classmates, by the community in which the school exists, it improves. And because your working vocabulary has improved, your test scores go up. It doesn't mean you're getting a better education, but you're exposed to a a higher quality Mm -hmm. of conversation and language, Mm -hmm. and that translates into better scores. Wow. So discipline, commitment, and reading. So if we have a young person out there that may be underage, under the age of 18, let's say, for instance, if they're between the ages of 8 and 15, and they're going to school every day, going through some of the barriers that you mentioned, and when they come home, mom's not there, dad's not there, uh, siblings may not be taking it, uh, taking education kind of seriously, but they want to do better. So their discipline, their commitment, and their reading habits could help progress them through all of these distractions. That, did I hear you correctly? Without question. Okay. And see, we got to realize something. Reading is a very good disciplinary exercise. Okay. When you read, you can't watch TV, mm. cell phone, video game, True. entertain phone calls. True. Reading requires focus. Reading requires focus. 
And although some people can read with the background music, okay, I can tolerate that. Mm -hmm. But reading requires focus. It is a disciplinary activity. And one of the reasons our children don't read more is because they don't have the self-control to make themselves sit down, stay still, and focus on the material. So good readers are often people who also have some degree. They may not be perfect at it, but people who read on the regular, who have that ability to force themselves to focus on that to the exclusion of other things, they tend to end up having, mm -hmm. you know, a respectable level of, 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 of self-discipline and control. Okay. Dr. Umar, if you don't mind, I know we talked about some of the things that the parents can do. Um, but I do know, and I'm pretty sure that you might have seen this as well, several people in the community that want to volunteer and help, but they may not be the parent of some of these children that are in the schools. So can you educate the volunteer on their options to help what's going on? Uh, yes. In fact, there's a volunteer effort that I would certainly welcome any of your listeners to participate in, and that would be with the National Independent Black Parent Association. The National Independent Black Parent Association is an organization we started almost a year ago in May of 2016 mm -hmm. to organize black parents at every school district in America okay. so that they could fight against racism, bias, and disproportionality in America's school in the seven key areas of special education, discipline, finance, policy, social support, homeschooling, and parent advocacy. Again, special education, discipline, policy, finance, social support, homeschooling, and parent advocacy. And if any of your listeners would like to join a chapter mm -hmm. of the National Independent Black Parent Association, or if they are interested in starting a chapter of the National Independent Black Parent Association, they can get in contact with me, uh, by email at drumarjohnson.com. Um, also, drumarjohnson at yahoo.com, D R U M A R Johnson.com, or D R U M A R Johnson at yahoo.com, mm -hmm. and also by phone at 844 4 D R U M A R, 844 4 D R U M A R. And in fact, in about two weeks, mm -hmm. I'm going to be hosting a teleconference orientation mm -hmm. by phone for brothers and sisters who are interested in starting a National Independent Black Parent Association study group. Mm -hmm. In order to start a chapter, you must attend one of our regional training conferences. There are three of them held every year. The next one will be in May, and it will likely be in the Midwest in May. Mm -hmm. And so they would need to attend that before they can be president of a chapter. But until they attend that conference, they are welcome to start a black parent study group where they live, where they basically bring black parents together, talk to them about their issues, mm -hmm. uh, have conversations and discussions about what needs to be done. They don't officially take any action. It's only a study group, almost like a think tank, to begin you know, to come up with the ideas of things that needs to happen once they become a chapter. Mm -hmm. But if anyone is interested in starting a chapter, excuse me, a study group of the National Independent Black Parent Association, they can definitely get in contact with me soon so they can be a part of that teleconference orientation in the next two weeks. We are trying to build the first national movement by black parents uh, to change education in this country. We've had a national civil rights movement. We've had other types of national movements, black labor, but we've never had black parents. We've never had black parents organized, and so we're trying to do that at this time. Okay. Thanks, Doc. Um, what we want to do right now is, uh, I know you mentioned reading, and you were talking about some of the things that we can come together and have that study group, right? Can you, have, can you give us some suggestions of books that people can just start reading on their own to get kind of familiar with some of the things that you've seen and some of the things that you know good and well that we need to know moving forward if we're going to be effective in this fight? In addition to my book, Psychoacademic Holocaust, the Special Education and ADHD Wars Against Black Boys, in addition to my book, and I do want to caution your, your listeners, do not purchase my book online. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone is bootlegging my book. They're selling fraudulent copies on Amazon. We're currently trying to track them down. 
So please do not purchase my book on Amazon. It's a fall. Okay. Um, contact me directly through the, through the website, and um, they will be able to order the book directly from me. Okay. So that is, um, that's the first thing. Um, do not go on Amazon. Book, do not go on Amazon, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, do not go on Amazon. My book is self-published. Okay. The only way to get it is to get it from me. If you get it from anybody else, it's a plagiarized. It's a oh, book wow. Plagiarized. Oh, wow. Okay. Continue, please. Yeah. And uh, when I was in, uh, where was I at? Uh, before Chicago. I forget where I was, but like two days, two, three days ago, a brother came up with a fake copy, bought the book online. He didn't know no better. Mm -hmm. And um, I told him that it was plagiarized, and I gave him a free copy. Wow. Since, you know, he had a, a fake book. It's thinner, it's darker, mm -hmm. the pages are thinner. You can tell the difference if you've ever seen an original. Yeah. But, um, so they need to read my book. The other thing they need to read, too, is not a book, and that is they need to read the Student Code of Conduct for this school district. Mm. They need to read the Parent Handbook. These are things that black parents need to have a copy of and they need to read. The average black parent that has never read the Student Code of Conduct mm. for their child's school. The average black parent Rich or poor, rich or poor, right. has not read the parent handbook. How could you not read the parent handbook? How could you not read the code of conduct? Something else that they need to read, they need to read the teacher's contract with the school district. They need to read the teacher's contract with the school district. Every parent should read the teacher's contract with the school district so they can see exactly what teachers are allowed to do and what teachers are not allowed to do. Get a copy of the union contract. It's a key union contract with your child's school district. Read that. They also need to, if they think their child needs special ed or if the child is in special ed, they need to download um, their school district special education policy. They need to read the school district special ed policy. They need to read the state special ed code. Okay, so a lot of what parents need to read is not a book. A lot of it is free. It is mm -hmm. downloadable. It is on the school district's website. Mm -hmm. It is on the State Department of Education's website. And it is on the state school board's website. That's what they need to be reading. Mm -hmm. Most parents are totally ignorant about school law and school policy because they do not read about it. And that's what they need to start with. Mm -hmm. The only book that they need to read right now is mine. Most of what they need that will be important for them to protect their kids is the policies and the state statutes as it relates to education. So if you're listening right there um, live, ladies and gentlemen, even if you're a student um, in your specific county, you need to go to the Board of Education website and read every single policy you can get your hand on and the contracts of the teachers. Is that correct? Oh, without question. And for those listeners you have who will be reaching out to me, hopefully soon, mm -hmm. uh, to start a study group and ultimately become a chapter of the National Independent Black Parent Association. One of our models is we investigate, we educate, we advocate. We investigate, we educate, we advocate. Okay. That is our motto. So education is the first step of the National Independent Black Parent. We investigate. We get the information. That means we read the policy. We go to the school board meetings. That's another big problem I have. Black parents do not attend school board meetings. If, if you want to find the whitest meeting in the black community, the whitest meeting in the black community is the monthly school board meeting. That is the whitest meeting in the black community. You want to go place where it's going to be number of black folks, excuse me, number of white folks and no black folks, go to the school board meeting. Black parents are not there. White folks are there. Why? Because they get the grants. They're getting the contracts. Mm -hmm. They're taking out the charter school application. White folks are always there getting your money and getting your service, but we're not there. So presidents of the National Independent Black Parent Association are required to attend every monthly school board meeting. How can we make a difference if we don't even know what's going on? That's correct. Um, and the... Um the flow chart or the um, the um, infrastructure of your Black Parent Association, they can look, they can reference that online. How you want it structured and how it's supposed to be ran. Nah, well. Okay. A simple summary of 
what study groups can do and what they cannot do. Gotcha. And then they will participate on the orientation, and then they can go ahead and start operating their study group until they attend um, the um, next training conference. And you have to, you have a year. You have a year to convert from a study group to a chapter. If you do not attend a training conference within 12 months' time from the start of your study group, then that study group will be frozen. It will be discontinued mm-hmm. until we find someone else who's more motivated to turn it into a chapter. Okay, that's that's understood. And uh, uh, will you repeat how people can get in contact with you and what they must do in order to be introduced and how they can start their chapter? Can you repeat that for me? Uh, definitely, definitely. If they're interested in starting a study group, which mm-hmm. is a prelude to prelude. the chapter, mm-hmm. then they can email me at Dr. Umar Johnson at yahoo.com. That's D R U M A R Johnson mm-hmm. at yahoo.com. They can also email me to the website, drumarjohnson.com. Okay. Um, they can also call 844 D R U M A R. Again, 844 D R U M A R. Then I also want your listeners to know that every Tuesday morning I host a free black parent teleconference. Yes, well, okay. Every Tuesday morning, if parents have any questions about their children in the areas of education and mental health, they can call 857-232-0158, 857-232-0158, and the access code is 870-864-POUND, 870-864-POUND. Again, that is every week. 6 a.m. until 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay. Eastern Standard Time. And with that, they can get all the free answers they want if they want a private consultation. Okay. If any of your parents listening to this broadcast, if they want a private consultation, okay. they can email me and they can request a private consultation. It costs $50 and they can send me their child's paperwork and we will set up a time on the telephone where I can go over everything with them and give them some consultation on what they need to do next. So you got public consultation for free, okay. private consultation for cheap, and then they need to read my book, and then they need to become a part of the National Independent Black Parent Association. But let me also make them aware of uh, the second annual Black College and Consciousness Tour, okay. which I'm going to be working on the next week or two to finalize that registration should be ready in the next couple of weeks. Uh, 11 to 17 year old black boys and girls for 14 day, 14 night overnight camp, a boot camp, okay. a black power boot camp. Uh, we'll be going from Atlanta this year and we will be visiting Morehouse, Tuskegee, Spelman, South Carolina State, Tennessee State, Fitz, Lamone, Owen College, uh, and the list goes on. The Oyotunji African Village, the National Civil Rights Museum, the Selma uh, African History Museum, the Montgomery Civil Rights Institute, the Charleston, South Carolina Civil War Trail, the Dr. King Center. Last year, we did Lincoln, Cheney, Hampton, Norfolk State, uh, University of Maryland, Eastern Shore, Delaware State, Howard, Coppin. We did the Nat Turner Trail, Harry Tubman Home, Fred Douglas House, Benjamin Banneker Home, Nat Turner Trail. Mm -hmm. Uh, We did the Underground Railroad the Great Black Swags Museum, the African Holocaust Museum. It's, it's my, my college tour is different from a lot of others because we just don't take them to colleges. Mm-hmm. We also raise their consciousness by exposing them to information and significant landmarks in the black struggle in America so they get the best of both worlds. They get the college and the consciousness. Okay. This year, the dates of the tour will be, uh, what is it, June 28th to July the 12th, I believe it is. Mm-hmm. June 28th to July the 12th. 14 days, 14 nights, boys and girls co-ed, two to a room. We stay in nice hotels. We take them to the Great Avengers, Thorny Park. We play paintball, pizza parties, pool parties. They have a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. Uh, no child. I didn't have a single kid, even the 11-year-old. I didn't have a single kid mm-hmm. say, I'm ready to go home. Okay. They wanted to stay even longer after the two weeks, so... If you got parents out there who are interested, again, they can use the email or the phone number 
to get in contact with me about that as well. Doc, how much longer? I know you have a, uh, another engagement to go to. How many minutes do we? you think we have? Uh, it is, uh, we can go until uh, 8.30. 8.30, cool. All righty. All right, we have a couple of uh, questions for you. Um, sure. I know some people, we look... Uh, especially talking about all the issues in the black community. First of all, I would like to get your specific definition because we, we throw that word around black community, right? And I'm not sure if everybody understands exactly what that means. So if you don't mind, just elaborate on your definition of what the black community is. And after that, I want you to, if you don't mind, elaborate on the relationship between the youth and the elders and the perceived distrust that some people may feel. So your, your, right. your definition of black community first, and then the elder-youth relationship. Well, as far as community go, when we refer to a black community, it's important that people understand that we really don't have a black community mm. because community is a compound word. It means common unity. It means a group of people who are open okay. and working together towards a collective shared agenda. We don't have that. Okay. So when we say community, we're largely talking about wow. black people in America. <laughs> That's what we're really talking wow. about. There is no common agenda. There is no common platform. And we're definitely not organized. In order to have a community, you must be organized. Chinese have a community. Arabs have a community. Okay, East Indians have a community, European Jews have a community. They are organized, they have a shared agenda, mm. they meet as a community, not just the leaders, but the people. the people. They meet as a community, they determine what the agenda is, they decide who can come into the community, who can't. They control the shops, they control the politicians, they control the churches. We don't have a community. We have mm. neighborhoods, residential districts, and concentration camps. We don't have a community. We have neighborhoods, residential areas. In concentration camps, we still have to get to community. So we still have to get there. So when we use that word, we're saying it as a thing that we must strive to obtain. Exactly. Not, we're oh, projecting okay. it as a reality to be achieved. Ah, so, okay. So I want to make sure, because sometimes I use that term as well, the black community. So I want to make sure that I'm using it in this proper context based off reality. You know what I mean? Because sometimes... What we have is a collection of tribes. That's what we have. Okay. We, it's ironic because okay. for us to not know exactly which ethnic nations from which we descend. That's true. Because that was stolen, you know, from us during slavery. Right. We are the most tribalistic Africans in the world without any, uh, without any conscious connection to that tribal history. I mean, we got every political and ideological <laughs> camp and, di and difference that you could probably, we're a collection of, black America is a collection of tribes, whether mm. it's the fraternities, the sororities, it's true. whether it's the conscious organizations, whether it's the churches, we are a collection of tribes, tribes. that's all we are. So let me ask you this. Um, and I want, and I already know I asked you, asked you a question, but since you mentioned tribes, I had a I had a really in depth conversation with a friend of mine. Is that I think at our detriment as a people, if we're tribal, we're fighting against an entity that's colonial. Um, and that was the first time I've ever heard of that. What are your thoughts on us as being naturally tribal people, but we're fighting against uh, colonialism? So how well, does that roll? We are naturally communalistic. We're naturally community oriented. Okay. We are we're, we're nature based people. Okay. You know, so we're about the community. Now the tribalism isn't something I would say that is organic to be an African. The tribalism okay. is the petty differences ah, that actually go. serve to keep different ethnic nations apart from each other. Okay. First of all, let us understand that the word tribe in and of itself is a racist word. Really? The word tribe, and yes, the word tribe, if you notice, they only use the word tribe when they're talking about us. It's deep. You never heard them call the Chinese tribe, the Korean tribes, you know, the, Jew, the, the, the Italian tribe, mm -hmm. the Irish tribe, okay. the Greek tribe. They only use tribe when they talk about blacks because it is a connotation of savagery. It is a connotation of bestiality. It is a connotation of dehumanization. Wow. 
Yes, tribe is a racist word. So we rather call it people or nation, hmm. culture or group. That's what we would say. So not the Zulu tribe, the Zulu people. Not the Zulu tribe, the Zulu nation. Hmm. Not the Zulu tribe, the, the, the Zulu group, the Zulu culture. Wow. So the, the correct terminology would be nation. People. Because they were not tribes, they were ethnic nations. Okay. You see, so that's why we would say use the word nation, culture, okay, or people, as opposed to tribe, because tribe is a racist word that white folks created to suggest the inhumanity of those of different groups of African people. Wow. So we did not call ourselves tribes; we were called tribes, and we we're repeating the word. Exactly. We never used that word on ourselves. That's pretty deep. That's pretty deep. Okay, next, I want to make sure that I get to these questions. And we have a parent that chimed in on uh, Facebook as well and wanted to get your take on some things. Uh, the second question I asked you was the relationship or the lack of relationship between the elders and the youth. Can you speak on some of the things that you've seen personally and what can we do to build a bridge to uh, close that gap? Yes, here's the issue. A lot of the old lion, young lion stuff, old lioness, young lioness, because it's amongst the males and the females too. Mm -hmm. A lot of that relates to castrated ego situations. Wow. In America, black men are not allowed to be men. Okay. We're not allowed to be men. We're not allowed to express masculinity because it's considered threatening. Black masculinity is threatening, okay. which is one of the reasons why a feminizing posture is so popular because you can make it in corporate America if you are an effeminate male, i.e. Don Lemon. You can make it if you're an effeminate male. You cannot make it as a masculine male. You see very few masculine men in leadership positions in this country. I don't care if it's corporate America. I don't care if it is uh, within the school system, politics, the media. Masculine black males do not make it far in this society. Hmm. Most masculine black males are in jail or they play sports. And that is it. Okay, so black masculinity is something that is quite feared in this country. You see, so when a black man is not allowed to be a man, you know, he's not allowed to express his masculinity through wealth. He's not allowed to express his masculinity through business ownership. He's not allowed to express his masculinity through capitalism. So we have been limited. The only way we're able to express our masculinity is by doing what? Through women. Mm. through sex and baby making women and then also through dominating other oppressed black men mm. dominating other oppressed black men that's why black on black crime is so prevalent mm. because when you're castrated when you're psychologically castrated as a male the only way you can do what realize your masculinity is by oppressing another male think about it. if you are powerless you have no political economic power your life has no relevance in america the black man's life has no relevance in this country. None. It is hated. That's all. If you want to realize, if you want to feel what power, you want to experience what power truly feels like. You want to experience true power. Do you know what you're going to have to do? Mm -hmm. the, the only way you're going to be able to experience true power is to dominate a woman, and not necessarily through rape. It's just through being able to win her over into mm -hmm. your life. That can give you a sense of masculinity. So in your relationships with females, with the opposite sex, and then also in your relationship with other oppressed black men through domination. Mm -hmm. See, to take a man's life, to take a man's life can give you a strong feeling of power. Mm -hmm. It is very negativistic. It is reactionary. It mm -hmm. is deplorable. It is unacceptable. It is inhumane. But guess what? It can fulfill your thirst for power. I mean, what? greater manifestation of power than to be able to take the life of another person. Mm. See, that's why we go through such extremes when we talk about black and black crime. See, we're not just looking to beat up another black man. We're not just looking, you know, to uh, dominate another black man. We want to take his life. Mm. Why is it necessary to take his life? Because you need to demonstrate that you have power. Black on black crime on a basic level mm -hmm. can be interpreted as a black man's exaggerated and desperate attempt to 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 develop some degree of power by taking the life of another man. Well it is the powerlessness. 
Right. Powerlessness is at the root of black on black fratricide. Right. You see, so let's translate that into black organization. Okay. You got a black man, he's a leader. Remember, the only time a black man is allowed to lead is in the black community. You're not allowed to lead in America. You're not allowed to lead in America. Barack Obama was president, and he was a very weak-ass president. He wasn't even allowed to lead because he, was, he couldn't do nothing to white presidents because he was too scared to do it. Mm -hmm. He wasn't allowed to lead. You see, so he was not a leader in any way, shape, or form. So when you become pastor of the church, when you become president of the black power movement, guess what? For the first time, you experience true power. You experience what you've always wanted your whole life. And because you're not allowed to have it anywhere else, guess what you do? You become a dictator. It goes mm -hmm. to your head. You don't want to show none of this power because it feels so good to finally be in control of something because the white man gave you control of nothing. And you end up going too far. And that's why the average black church is a dictatorship. That is why the average black organization is a dictatorship. Mm. We do not share power. And so what happens, you've been a pastor for 50 years. Another young brother comes along who also wants to pastor. Guess what? You don't allow him to lead. You don't allow him to do any sermons. You don't allow him to flex his young masculinity at all because you feel threatened by any other black man. You mm -hmm. feel threatened. You need absolute power because your thirst, your thirst has not been quenched, and it can never be quenched, because no matter how long you are the pastor, no matter how long you are the president, it will not be long enough to make up for all the times you could never be in society. And that is the root cause of why we do not pass in the black community. If you notice, we have the oldest leaders in America. We have the oldest leaders in America. We have pastors 80 and 90 years old. Mm -hmm. Why didn't that pastor turn that over to a young pastor? He doesn't have to disappear. He can still be there. He can mm -hmm. still be a pastor. Mm -hmm. What you begin to share, because you have to do what? Prepare the next generation. You have to prepare the next generation if you care about the community, not just your ego. Black mm -hmm. men don't do a good job of preparing the next generation. Why? Mm -hmm. Because to start preparing the next generation is to do what? Accept your mortality. Accept your mortality. Mm. And the last thing the castrated male of the black man wants to do is accept its mortality. Doc, I'm, uh, let's just move on because uh, i got to process that. That was, that was a lot. I appreciate your honesty with that. Your blunt honesty with it uh, is going to help us grow. Um, in fact, when I was in the UNIA, you know, the argument, I went through that. Okay. And in Philadelphia, I was the first vice president. I should have been the president of the chapter okay. of the division, as they're called in the Garvey movement. Mm -hmm. But I was never allowed to run for president of it because my elders, most of whom were old enough to be not my father, but my grandfather, mm -hmm. they were so jealous and insecure of what I brought to the table that they tried to cut off my leadership potential in every way shape or form mm. and i've learned a lot from those men most of whom are my ancestors now they've all joined the ancestors rest in peace to all of them i'm indebted to them okay. because i learned a lot about life i learned a lot about leadership i learned a lot about self hate mm -hmm. from them mm -hmm. you know so who i am now a lot of that wisdom came directly from the elders of the garvey movement in philadelphia mm -hmm. but although i learned a lot of good from them they also showed me you know how there was wow. and for those who know my personal history I had to leave the Philadelphia division of the UNIA in order to spread my wings right. and part of me becoming who I am now is a direct result of me stepping away from the table if you would had I never stepped away from that table I would be where I am now because those elders were dead set on not letting Mark Johnson ever become a leader within that division so I I've, I've saw firsthand how the old castrated uh, male ego can function to oppress up-and-coming leadership. This is what I got from what you just said. Um, and the thing that stuck out to me is the gap between the elders and the youth stems from the need to be the man instead of a man. Exactly. Wow. HNIC syndrome. It is the HNIC syndrome. The biggest psychological issue among black men is the HNIC syndrome. Look, wow. take Brother Malcolm. Okay. Malcolm X was murdered because of the HNIC syndrome. Mm -hmm. Malcolm was killed because people wanted to prevent him from becoming the HNIC. Mm -hmm. That's how 
threatened black men are by other powerful black men. Wow. HNIC Central. You know, for example, I've been invited to different events mm -hmm. by, quote, unquote, emerging black leaders, if you would. And I don't go to all of I got to be very circumspect in what I choose. Why? Okay. Because I'm a very effective orator. I'm probably the best one alive amongst our people right now. Um, I have a lot of charisma, and I can easily upstage someone else. Respect. And because I'm not interested in doing that, I'm interested in supporting the work, sometimes I have to look at a situation and say, you know what? Mm -hmm. I can't take that invitation. Because okay. if I take that invitation, I'm going to become the magnet at that event. And I'm not interested in taking away from someone else's attempt to, you know, be the HNIC. I'm not ah. interested in that. So I have to judge things from that angle. I have to really look at my strength of character as an organizer and as a leader. And if it's stronger than the next brother, out of respect for him, okay. I have to let him, uh, you know, be the king of his own castle because that can engender jealousy and animosity. I have people come to me and say, hey, we want you to meet this leader. We want you to meet this leader. We want you to work with this leader. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I have to say no. And they'll say why. And I'll say respectfully, in certain areas, I'm stronger than him. Mm -hmm. I'm much stronger than him in certain areas, and I know it's going to start jealousy because, see, that HNIC thing, Chris, it breeds the jealousy. It mm. breeds the animosity. Wow. It breeds the hate. When a black male is upstaged by another black male, even if it is accidentally, mm. because you can't hide who you are. You cannot hide. You cannot contain charisma. You don't have to say a word when you have charisma. And people already, you know, and, and with me, our, people already know who I am. So if I walk in that room, I'm going to take that attention. And then he's going to feel slighted, and that can affect our relationship. So I don't respect for emerging leaders, I stay out of their domain of leadership if I feel that my energy is going to be stronger than this. I have to because I know how dangerous the HNIC situation is amongst black males and it can get you killed. Dr. Umar, we're going to close with this last question and we have a, a question from uh, Samia from Atlanta. Hey, you know what, Brother Chris? I got a text from the parent just now. Oh, you got a dip? They're running late. So if you want to go until now, we can go until now. They're oh. running late, so all righty, let's roll then. All right, now check this out. We have a young lady named Samir from Atlanta, and she wants to get your opinion on the homeschooling aspect of trying to combat everything that you mentioned earlier. You know, you have a lot of people who say, well, I'm going to just homeschool my child, right? However, you have a lot of people who may not understand the details behind homeschooling. Can you elaborate on that, please? Uh, certainly. Uh, homeschooling is a very good, temporary alternative to the education system. I will not call it a solution. Okay. And that's because as a nationalist, as a pan-African nationalist, true solutions have to be systematic. That means they have to benefit the people, not just certain children. Mm -hmm. Because then that just becomes elitism. So a solution is something that eliminates the problem. Okay. Some parents' homeschooling doesn't eliminate the problem of miseducation because most parents can't afford to homeschool because they have to work. Right. So I think homeschooling is a good alternative, but it is a band-aid. It's not a solution. Okay. Black children have to be educated institutionally, okay, in schools that we build, run, own, and operate, and they have to be educated with other black children so that we can forge a collective consciousness. Mm. We have to forge a collective consciousness. The purpose of education is socialization. The number one reason children must be educated is so they can be taught, so that they can be taught how to function mm -hmm. within their community. They have to be taught how to function within their community. You cannot do that in isolation. Every black parent educating their own child doesn't give us the shared collective consciousness that we need. Mm -hmm. Education is all about socialization. You can't do that house to house. You have to do it in mass. Wow. You have to. It's like building a military, and every child in the military is going through an isolated military regimen. Mm -hmm. Where is the collective consciousness? Where is the brotherhood? Where is the sisterhood? You're not forging a sense of community through isolated education. And that's what homeschooling is. It's isolated education. Right. But it is a good temporary remedy. I'm not against it. I support it. That is one of the seven essential committees of every national independent black parent association chapter. Now, okay. for parents, I would say that the same thing that they need to consider when they're thinking about homeschooling. Okay. Number one, 
you cannot just homeschool just because you don't like the public school system. That's true. You have to homeschool because you really want to do it. I can't stress that enough. Mm -hmm. It cannot be a reaction to the school system. It must be a proaction based on what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have the time, if you don't have the energy, if you don't have the commitment, if you don't have the resources, then you're going to do a terrible job. Mm -hmm. You must do a personal inventory before you decide to homeschool your children. If you don't buy that, why do you go to homeschool? You ain't got the time to. And so sometimes what I tell parents that they should do is find a homeschooling teacher. A lot of black teachers are being laid off and fired because of racism, and so a lot of them are operating their own homeschool networks. Okay. They're operating their own homeschool networks. So guess what? Find you a homeschooling teacher. Find you a homeschooling teacher. And with that homeschooling teacher, you can get your child to the next day. Number two, you have to make sure you have a system of assessment. One of the biggest weaknesses of homeschooling parents is they don't have a system of assessment. Who do you have coming in to supervise you, coach you, and evaluate your kids to make sure you are teaching them well? Mm -hmm. Most homeschools don't have that. They assume that they're doing a good job. You can't assume nothing. you got to get somebody to come on, somebody from the outside, different set of eyeballs that they have. You're doing good with reading. But your math sucks. You can't mm -hmm. behind two, three grade levels of math. So what are you doing with your math curriculum? Let's look at your math curriculum and make that better. you got to have a coach. Mm -hmm. I do homeschool coaching. I also do homeschool assessment. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm somebody who will test your kids and let you know this is where they are and this is what you need to do. I do homeschool assessment. And if someone wants to reach me to do that, they can do that. I do do homeschool assessment. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's that. But you got to have a question. So number one, personal inventory, okay. you know, to make sure you have the psychological resources to homeschool. Child. Number two, make sure you have an assessment system. Number three, make sure you have discipline. Mm. Make sure you have discipline. Mm -hmm. In other words, your homeschool time got to be sacred. What do I mean by that? If you're going to homeschool your child Monday through Thursday from 8 o'clock to 1 o'clock. Right. Because I believe a child can be effectively homeschooled on 20 hours a week. Okay. I do. I don't think you need more. You can do more than 20. But if you do it well, you can do 20 hours. They don't need 35 like they get in the public school. That extra 15 ain't nothing but time wasters anyway. Resales and art class and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So 20 hours is good. But you got to be consistent. You can't talk about our homeschool from 8 to 1. And then from 9 to 10 o'clock, you on the phone with your mother. And then another phone call comes. And you're wasting another 30 minutes with the cable man. Mm -hmm. And then another 30 minutes with your personal business. And then another 30 minutes paying your online bills. And then you got nervous to say, we're done for the day. You're not done. You didn't even teach. Mm. You are lying to yourself. If you said, think you spent 45 hours with your kid. Truth of the matter is, you only spent 45 minutes with your kid because you kept on allowing interruptions. Here's what I would say. If you're going to homeschool, if you're going to homeschool, you will turn off the phone. You will turn off the computer. It should be sacred. You are in that space with your child. Nothing else matters for those 45 hours. Nothing else matters unless it is an emergency call, life or nothing else matters. If you're not ready to do that, you're not ready to homeschool. The first thing, you got to have a space in the house dedicated to homeschool. you got to have a space in the house dedicated to homeschool. And this is why a lot of parents mess up, because they don't treat it. you got to approach it in a professional way. Okay. you got to approach it in a professional way or it will break down and it won't be nothing to nobody. Your whole house is not a school. Don't let your whole house be a school. If it's going to be the attic, if it's going to be the spare bedroom, if it's going to be the basement, nothing happens in that space except homeschooling. Right. Literally. There's no TV, there's no video game. This is nothing but homeschooling. So the child knows that when I walk into this space, psychologically they prepare to learn because the only thing that happens in this space is learning. So it's like a homeschooling altar. Your homeschool space and your home is like an altar. It is sacred. Nothing goes in there for homeschooling. And the fifth thing you have to do is you have to honestly ask yourself the question. Okay. Are you the best person to homeschool your child? And let right. me tell you why. Right. A lot of black parents are not the best person to homeschool their children because a lot of us are too hard on our kids because they are our kids. We expect perfection from our own biological children. <laughs> so now let's try, we can be patient with them because they're not ours. But for our kids, they're supposed to get it right in the first try. For our kids, they're supposed to be proven because they're our kids. They're supposed to understand the way that we teach. Mm. So if you're going to be too critical of your child, if you're going to be too condemnatory and accusatory of your child, then you should not homeschool because all you're going to do is destroy their self-esteem. I've seen black parents destroy the self
self-esteem of their children by being too hard on them. If you know you're going to be too hard, don't homeschool. And the other thing I'm going to say, you have to create a schedule. And you also have to determine how long you plan on homeschooling. Are you only homeschooling for a year? Are you going to homeschool until they finish the 12th grade? Mm -hmm. Are you going to homeschool for four years? Why is that important? Right. If your child is going to be returning to the school system at some future point in time, you need to make sure that you are keeping up with the school district's state standards for grade level. Right. State standards for grade level to make sure your child is where they need to be when you decide to stick them back in school. Because what happens a lot of times is we homeschool for two or three years, stick them back, we didn't teach him a damn thing and got a child of three, four, five grade levels behind and had it being stuck in special ed because the parents never homeschooled. They were just home fooling around. There's a difference between a homeschool and a home fool. Wow. Wow. Okay. All righty. Um, next question. Uh, let's get right into it. Uh, you mentioned the school that you plan to open. Um what are some things, and I'm pretty sure that you may not be the only person in this whole country who wants to open their own school, but people who want to open their own schools, what are some things that they have to keep in mind, and what are some things they have to really watch out for? Uh, that would depend on the type of school they're trying to open and how large okay. you know that they want it to be. Okay. But generally speaking, they have to make sure that the school that they acquire is able to be adjusted to their school concept. So you need area and space and modalities to meet the type of curriculum mm -hmm. that you're going to implement. You want a school that's in a neighborhood where it can be marketed well. In other words, you don't want a school in a place that's competing with 20 or 30 other independent schools. So you want to make sure you're in a neighborhood where the school can feed. Right. Uh, you also want to make sure that you create a very strong uh, what you want to call it, uh, homeschool uh, relationship, you, parent participation. Uh, you want to make sure that parents can participate in the education because a lot of parents do want you know to participate, so you want to make sure you do that. Also, your funding, you want to make sure that you understand your business plan and make sure that you will be able to sustain and even grow the school over time. Um, also, you want to do a good job of screening the people who you're ultimately going to have working for you because the school is like a nation. Right. It's literally like a nation. Everything that a nation needs, school needs. It needs security for defense. It needs food. It needs logistics. It needs insurance. It needs propaganda. A school is like a nation. And so you have to really screen who you let come into your school. That's going to be my toughest job. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, the toughest part of my school, once it's open, is it going to be getting the students? It isn't going to be the curriculum. It's going to be none of that. It's going to be making sure I don't let the wrong people in because there's going to be a lot of opportunists and other types of folk who are going to want to try to get behind the walls of my school and some of them just to destroy it. Wow. Because black people love nothing more than destroying other black people. So for me, making sure I find the best people and to make sure I keep out potential disruptors is going to be my toughest job. The personnel, it's always the personnel. It's the personnel, the human resources is the biggest issue when it comes to any helping profession mm. as education is. Not the, not the financial resources, yeah. not the material re Human, it is the people that make or break the school, as I said earlier. It ain't the school that teach, it's the teachers that teach. Okay. For the, for the energy that, um, that you demand to keep this going on, right? Uh, the energy that you use to keep fighting every day. Uh, dealing with the uh, situations, dealing with our youth, and dealing with our quote-unquote black community that we're trying to establish. What are some things that keep you sane? Because uh, obviously you're a school psychologist. However, some of the things that you see on a daily basis, that has to affect you too. So what are some of the things that you do to keep your mindset intact? Uh, well, number one, I always try to build a strong relationship with my ancestors. You know, I practice the West African spiritual system of the Europe, but known as EFI. So, in all cultural spiritual systems, ancestral relationships are very key. So, I try to stay very close to my ancestors. I think that without that relationship with them, I don't know if I would still be here, to be honest with you, because I don't have a lot of people I can trust. I don't have a lot of friends. 
Okay. Uh, I don't know a lot of good people. Um, I would say you're one of the few good people I actually have in my life, and I know we haven't done a lot of work together, but you're one of those genuine souls, you know, that I have in my life who I can reach out to if I ever needed some support. But there's few of those people. Most people who come to me come with agendas. They come to a, they come with agendas, male and female. It's a romantic agenda or it's an agenda to get famous off of my name. It's an agenda to build their platform off of mine. Very few sincere people come to me. It's one of the toughest parts of my job finding the right people who are coming here for the right reason, which is why I would say the whole celebrity aspect of being Dr. Umar Johnson does come with a serious downside. Wow. It comes with a very serious downside because people tend to forget that you're not a celebrity, you're a revolutionary. And because of that, you know, you're looking for people who want to make a difference. And there's a lot of sacrifice involved in this, and I don't think people understand it or not. So the ancestral veneration is key to me. Obviously, building my relationship with God, supreme ruler of the universe, uh, without whom none of us would be here. That's also very important to me. Mm -hmm. And then getting that much needed R&R. &R. For example, this is March. Mm -hmm. This is the first day of my vacation in March. And it's not a true vacation because I still have to take care of and administrative stuff, visiting schools and mm -hmm. the fundraiser and putting together the college tour and Doing trying interviews. to finalize the African trip. <laughs> you Doing know, there's still a lot that like has to be done. Right. But I take regular breaks now to right. make sure my mind gets the type of rest that it needs so I don't suffer from a, a nervous breakdown. Right, 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 man. Dr. Umar, I can't thank you enough for the information that you've shared tonight. Uh, I know we're coming down. You said we have uh, up until 9 o'clock, right? Uh, yes, sir. To around nine o'clock. So, uh, what I want to do is to make sure that I maximize this interview. Uh, you're a very busy person, and honestly, too, I respect rest as well. Uh, so, when it's when it's time for you to uh, actually sit down and reboot and get your energy back up, I want to respect that as well. So, however, I do want to let you know um, about the information that you've shared so far. What that has actually done to me, or done for me, um, that whole conversation that we briefly had tonight about the gap between the youth and the elders in our community that right there hit home I would say because um, sometimes we have friction not only in our communities but you know some people's first community is their family honestly and some people's community doesn't even go past their family so there's a lot of people who have elders in their family that they think they cannot go talk to and some elders in the family that they think they can't even talk to the youth because some people will say, well, this new generation. Have you ever heard people talk about this new generation? And some of the Yes, and they talk about it as if they are not the root from which the new generation was birthed. You know, they, you know uh, we keep trying to disassociate ourselves from the youth, but they are the root and result of who we were, as they say. You judge a tree by the fruit that it bears. Mm. And so there is no separation between the youth and the adults. They are what happens when raising your children as a community is no longer your priority. This is what you get. That's deep. Um, we, on our radio show, this manhood mindset, we tried to talk about self-accountability, right? Um, we not only talk about our plight, but we also talk about our possibilities. Can you tell us about well, your opinion of the thin line between self-responsibility and blame? Because I think a lot of people don't understand that because sometimes I'm pretty sure some of the things that you talked about about our uh, community or the community that we were trying to build, you said a lot of things that some people are going to be offended at. How dare he say we hate each other? How dare he say we don't trust each other? This, that, and the other, right? However... How are we going to take care of our problems if we don't take responsibility of our part in it? So for the people who get, I guess, offended at the truth behind the quote-unquote black community, what is your, um, what are your suggestions on how they can get through that initial pain? Because honestly, some of the things that you were saying, I was like, ah, you know, some, are, those, are those some of the things that I actually do? Do I look at people and uh, distrust them? Do I look at people side eye, uh, you know, in, in this whole system that we try to uh, survive or whatnot? So can you speak on how can we get over ourselves and look at ourselves in a reality uh, mentality? The greatest victim of slavery 
was that the master reproduced himself in us. Mm -hmm. That's the greatest victory of slavery. He made robots out of his slaves. And those robots in turn made their children into more robots. And so here's the thing. One of the reasons why the world does not feel sad or bad about what happens to black folks in America in particular is because we are the only African population on earth that totally has the ability, totally has the ability to solve its own problems without government intervention. Mm. We could do it ourselves. We don't need the government to do nothing. Last year, 2016, we spent $600 million on McDonald's, $2 billion on Air Jordan. Four billion dollars on liquor and alcohol. Mm -hmm. Nine billion dollars on weave and perm. We purchased three times the Mercedes Benzes of white America, while white America mm -hmm. has three times the amount of wealth of Black America. So clearly, we have the economic ability to build our own hospitals, mm -hmm. our own schools, our own grocery stores. We could put our own men to work. We can mm -hmm. put our young men and women through training. We have the education and the income to solve our own problems. You got the financial resources. You got the educational resources. You got the material resources. You ain't got the psychological resources. Mm -hmm. Black folks are not interested in black folks. We hate ourselves. And the further we get away from slavery, the more we hate ourselves. It's getting worse every year. I would argue that this current population of black folks that we have walked on this earth today mm -hmm. is the worst. We are the most psychologically unhealthy group of black folks that was ever born on this continent. Wow. We're the most selfish, we're the most Eurocentric, we're the most uh, 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 disinterested group of black folks that our people have ever produced. So self-responsibility is key. As a Pan-Africanist, as a Garvey, we believe in self-determination in all things. Mm -hmm. Although we can blame, or should I say hold the white man accountable for what he's done, and we have to, because we are not, we don't control none of the institutions that are used against us. That's true. So we can never be the cause of our own problems. You don't control the school system, okay. so you cannot be the reason the schools ain't working. You don't control the criminal injustice system. True. So you can't be the reason black men are in jail. You don't control the economic system. You're not the reason that we're unemployed. Black folks do not control a single institution in this country. So there's no way you can be the cause of your own problems. Hmm. It's impossible. Okay. But you are. You are the reason why you still have those problems. Nobody is going to solve our problems but us. Nobody. Wow. So although we understand that racism created these problems, we got the ability to fix them. I have total confidence in a black man and woman's ability to solve these problems. We can fix this. This is nothing. Mm -hmm. This is nothing except the fact that we don't care. And every time we talk, when we have conversations about how to fix the problems, we say, well, we're going to talk about the solutions, the solutions, the solutions. There's only one solution, and everybody knows what it is, but they don't want to accept it. And that solution is you have to do what? Take responsibility for your own future, mm -hmm. your own destiny. Mm -hmm. We have to build independent black communities. We have to do for ourselves mm -hmm. what the Chinese are doing for themselves. Mm -hmm. We have to do for ourselves what the European Jews are doing for themselves. And black folks don't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. We don't want to hear any solution that means we got to spend money, we got to spend time, we got to spend resources. We don't want that. We want something simple. We want to vote. We want to pray. Mm -hmm. We want to march. We do not have to commit. Black mm -hmm. folks don't have any equity in each other. We don't have any equity in each other. So any solution that requires me to spend money on helping black folks, I'm not interested in it. And that's why we stay stuck where we are, mm -hmm. because we're not willing to invest in ourselves. So we're like the people walking in quicksand. I know you mentioned uh, before, uh, I actually seen you at a, a previous event in Atlanta, and I remember one of the things that you talked about was the difference between being conscious and being committed being conscious and being committed. And you said, you reiterated over and over again, I need committed people. Can you elaborate on that? Because I know you just hinted on it a little bit. Can you can you really drive that home? Yes, consciousness is just being aware. Okay. You know, consciousness is being well read. Well read. Consciousness is knowing the facts. Consciousness is knowing the date. Consciousness is being able to uh, restate the historical record. Mm -hmm. But consciousness is only cerebral. It's intellectual. You can be very conscious of the black reality, but have no commitment to changing it. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of black scholars in this country. 
They are masters of the history. Mm -hmm. They can regurgitate the historical record. They can run it down. Mm. But when it comes to being a part of the solution, don't look for them. Mm. And so we assume that consciousness is everything. It's not. Consciousness is only one of the five essential psychological variables that are needed to be a part of the black revolution. The other four. In addition to consciousness, you got to have the courage. And that's more important than the consciousness to me. Yeah. Because a man who don't know but is willing to fight is infinitely more useful for my purposes than a man who knows and ain't willing to fight. Courage is more important than consciousness. Mm. Commitment is more important than consciousness. Consistency is more important than consciousness. Mm. Creativity is more important than consciousness. Those are the five. Consciousness, commitment, consistency, creativity, and courage. You need all five. And you should judge all black leaders and organizers by those five. By those five. You got to have all five. It cannot be one or two or three. You need all five. One bit, bit, okay. Our 19th century is the greatest period of black renaissance we've had since our fall from the great kingdoms of Africa. Okay. 19, 1800 to 1899, we did more than we've done any other century in existence ex out since the fall of Africa, since okay. the fall. Okay. Okay. That, and we need to study that. Right. That's the century we get Pan-Africanism. That's the century we get Harriet Tubman. That's the century we get Nat Turner. That's the century we get Shaka Zulu. Mm -hmm. That's the century we get Ya Ashantiwa. That's the century you get so many black inventions. That's Booker T. Washington. Mm -hmm. You know, Elijah Muhammad is born that century. Garvey is born that century. That's the century we need to study. That's the most progressive black century ever since our uh, sojourn outside of the African continent. Mm -hmm. And we need to study it. And guess what? They didn't have all the consciousness. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what we know. Intellectually, this is probably the smartest generation of black folks ever, but it's also the self-hating. Look at that. Look at that. It's the smartest, and it's the most self-hating at the same time. Because intellectual knowledge is over. Intellectual knowledge is exaggerated too much in the black community. Mm. It's exa Just teach our kids where they come from. That don't mean nothing by itself. You know how many sellouts know where they come from? You know how many sellouts can give you the whole African history? You know how many sellouts can run down the history of any black organization? Consciousness is nothing without the courage and the commitment. We've got to make sure our children have all five. Doc, that was, uh, that was it, man. <laughs> that, that was it. Uh, I think um, what you shared tonight really has um, helped me as a person. Um, and I try to, you know, what we do on the radio show, we try to make sure we don't speak for other people. But I can speak for myself. Uh, this was some profound information that you have shared with us. And uh, I'm going to work on myself to see how committed I really am. Um, there's one thing about getting more information and more information, but when it's time to put up or shut up, do we have the actual courage to actually do it? Um, so I want to just, first of all, just thank you for um, carving out a, a piece of your schedule just to, you know, bless our show with your presence, man. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, a lot of people may see you all over the Internet, all over TV, and, and really don't understand who you are and get a chance to talk to you directly. But I want to just tell you how much I really appreciate you just sacrificing your time just to talk to the audience who support manhood mindset at our chapter of Omega Sci-Fi down here at Georgia Southern. So I really want to appreciate Thank that. Thank you, my brother. I really do, man. So, uh, and, and a lot of people don't know that you actually came down to Georgia Southern a couple of years ago in 2014 and, uh, and spoke to our students. And I remember that in, that uh, entire um, uh, experience and the students who had a chance to get to know you and get to talk to you and shake your hand and uh, have a full-fledged conversation with you, um, their lives were forever changed. And for a lot of people that don't know is that when you see Dr. Umar in person, um, a lot of people didn't know that day is when I came and asked you, I said, hey, I know you're quite busy, but we got some students that, you know, you kind of changed their life earlier today and they want to talk to you. And Dr. Umar Johnson stayed and talked to the students down here until 10, what, 1045 that night? It was, yes, sir. Yeah, it was quite late. So um, just that type of uh, commitment, because uh, you, you, are, you are a very well-educated brother. However, you have time for people, and I think a lot of people don't understand how valuable that may be for us to, to, to appreciate, I would say. So I want to just tell you as an, uh, one man to another, I really appreciate your commitment, your time, your effort, and your consistency. Um, we see a lot of 
we see a lot of times where we come up and we try to stand against things that may be detrimental and sometimes we get complacent or we get rewarded to shut up you know what i mean so i, yeah. I really want to uh, just tell you thank you um on behalf of me um and everybody on the show uh thank you for what you're doing um peace and blessings to you uh keep your strength up keep your health up you know the people are going to need you man and and um just that's pretty much it, man. So we're going to ask you to close out the show with your contact information again and your final thought for tonight. Yes, indeed. Contact information, drumarjohnson.com, drumarjohnson at yahoo.com. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dr. Umar Johnson. Again, Twitter and Instagram at Dr. Umar Johnson. If you're on Facebook, you can follow me at Dr. Umar Ifatunde. I use my Yoruba last name on Facebook. Ifatunde is spelled I-F-A-T-U-N-D-E. Dr. Umar Ifatunde on Facebook. The profile picture is myself and Brother Charlemagne on the Breakfast Club interview. Ah, also, yeah. uh, the Tuesday morning call uh, every Tuesday. Uh, Black College and Consciousness Tour coming up. Mm -hmm. We're also going back to Africa this year, two-week Africa tour. I should have that information in the next couple of weeks as well. That will be the last week of July, mm -hmm. first week in August. And again, anybody who wants to start a study group for the National Independent Black Parent Association, uh, please reach out to me. Individuals who are interested in having me come to speak, they can email my assistant, Ms. Williams, at drumarspeaks at yahoo.com. That's mm -hmm. D-R-U-M-A-R speaks with an S at yahoo.com. That goes straight to her. Okay. My personal email is Dr. Umar Johnson at yahoo.com, uh, but I'll be taking off the month of March, so I'll be available for some limited uh, telephone conversations and that whole type of thing there. So that's oh, phone number 8444-D-R-U-M-A-R, 8444-D-R-U-M-A-R. And I close with a quote from the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, the greatest black leader of the 20th century who said without confidence in yourself you are twice defeated in the race of life but with confidence you have won even before you have begun ladies and gentlemen you have tuned in tonight for 91.9 the buzz manhood mindset the zeta delta delta job double make a sci-fi return incorporated with our brother you are my mind campaign and our initiative we'd like to personally thank dr umar johnson for blessing our, our show tonight hopefully you got some things out of it i know definitely i did however if you listen to the show tonight we will be recording it and put it up on facebook and youtube and soundcloud and things of that nature we highly suggest when you listen to the show that you write down notes and not only when you write down notes and be conscious of the problem be committed to solving it dr umar johnson we really appreciate it man we want to uh just wish you many blessings and and god speed to you brother thank you my brother take care all right will do thank you ladies and gentlemen for tuning in to manhood mindset 919 the buzz we're located in wvgs 91.9 big deal you got anything to tell to the people no, I'm chilling, I'm chilling. Yeah, man. So thank y'all so much for people who've been uh, tuning in to... Uh <laughs> Pretty much. So uh, thank you for everybody who chimed in on Facebook Live. Thank you for everybody who chimed in uh, in the local uh, community at 91.9. Hopefully we got something out of it. It was not necessarily for everyone to agree with what was going on, but it at least gets some information that you can chew on. If you don't agree with it, that's good. You don't have to agree with it. Uh, all the views and expressions were of Dr. Umar Johnson and of the hosts of the show and not reflective of the radio show itself. So I want to make sure everybody understood that we we're not telling anybody what to think we just interviewed our guest to see how he actually thought all right and so we gave you options um different comments suggestions or whatnot and feel free one of the biggest things that you can do is educate yourself so if you're wondering how to solve the problem you might want to get to the root and miseducation is one of the biggest roots of our issues so make sure that you get the reading be committed be courageous be conscious but also too We've been through a lot as a people. Go get yourself some counseling. All right. Go and talk to somebody. Get you some get you some help. There's nothing wrong with helping yourself, especially if you're setting yourself up for success and how to um, put yourself in a position where you can actually contribute to rebuilding or building in the first place the black community. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for tuning in. We'll be back next week. 
Peace out.